So previously, we were supposed to do the specifics of uh, empirical formulae, and there were a few cases that we need to handle uh, at that point, and we were only able to handle first two cases out of a total of three cases. Okay, so for empirical formulae, usually you're provided with elements or their masses. The first case was when you're provided with masses of all the elements here that you have in the question. Like for example, you have magnesium over here, oxygen over here, both the masses are given. What were your steps? You take the masses, you write the MR, you uh, calculate the number of moles by dividing mass over molar mass, you get the molar ratio. If needed, you can simplify it, or you can simply put it that as the subscripts of those elements getting your empirical formula. Now the simplification step might uh, be required if you don't end up with the whole numbers at the end of molar ratio and you still get decimals, and then you will require simplification. The rules of simplification are written over here. Then we did a couple of examples to understand what the formulas are going to be. Later on for the second case, when mass of few elements were given, but not all, and total mass was given instead of one element that was still not a part of it. For example, in this very case, you can see that a mass of oxygen is not given, okay? So we calculated it by subtracting the rest from the total, and we can always do those ones. And I gave you the example of which you can actually do, so you can get a good hang of that. Now this was very easy. In the second case, if you have the total, this is the preliminary step you do before all of the rest of the steps. Means writing the MR, getting the number of moles and the molar ratio, if needed be the simplification step, and finally the empirical formula, okay? Which actually brings us to the third case. So we are going to go with the third case today. I'm gonna stop sharing these pictures and we're gonna to get to the whiteboard. Now. So empirical formulae and third case. Now in third case, which is actually the most common case in IGCSC, is actually when you are provided with percentage composition. Now, when you are provided with percentage composition, that means the percentage portion of every element for that specific formula would be given. And from there on onwards, you have the same set of steps. It's just that the first step, or which I've been calling the zero step in our previous work, would be different. Just like you used to count the total, you are going to do one step like that, and then you're going to convert them into masses. Now, this sounds a little obnoxious, how to convert percentage into mass. Well, what we're going to do work actually likes a trick. I'm gonna come up with an example and I'm, ex I'm gonna explain what I'm talking about. Okay, let's say we have H and O and hydrogen 11.11%. And that's about it. That's what you are given as question. The compound is only made up of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. The percentage composition of hydrogen is 11.11%. You're not even given the composition for oxygen. So what are you supposed to do? Remember, the total is always 100%. So it's really easy to calculate this. So 100 minus 11.11 would give you around 88.89 percent for oxygen. Now in the next step, which I was talking about as a zero step, convert this percentage sign into gram sign. And we are actually doing it for our own ease. 
And from there on onwards, the steps are really the same. MR or AR, which hydrogen is one and oxygen is 16, then mole, then molar ratio, right? And then simplification, if that step is required. This step is not a must, but you can do this step if you're not getting whole numbers even after the more ratio step. So go ahead, solve the rest of it. And I'm pretty sure that you would be able to come up with the right answer, the right empirical formula. Are you doing it? Yes, yeah, sir. Good, continue. Sir, is it H2O? Yes, perfect. The answer is H2O. Okay, let's move on to the first question on your right. Keep doing the same thing and you keep landing on the correct answers. Take your time. Remember a pencil, a piece of paper, a copy of periodic table and a calculator is important for this entire chapter, not just for these questions. Did you just say MGS of four? Yes. Perfect, yes, the answer is MGS of four, magnesium sulfate. Good, let's move on to question number two. Take your time. 
Yes, the answer is NaHCO3, sodium hydrogen carbonate, or baking soda that we eat almost every day. Good, continue the last question. Yes, the answer is CH2O for the last one. Are you saying CH2O? Yes. Good, good, that's correct. Okay, so we are done with this third case. Now, you may have to handle elements in there. You may have to handle something different, like sometimes they actually go with compounds. So actually, let's get back to the book. I'm going to stop sharing over here, and we're going to get back to the book. Just a minute. So here we are back to the book and they give you the same set of steps for empirical formula. This is a very good question for percentage composition, percentage by mass. You'd notice the compound is actually made up of phosphorus and oxygen. See, it's just 44% and you need to do the rest on your own. So it's 100 minus 44, it's almost the same process. Take a look at it. The simplest ratio, after we're done with the molar ratio step, is just one and 2.5. Then you need to simplify it. In order to simplify it, you get to two and five, and that's how you wind up with this formula P205. All right, so another case for okay. which these questions can come is to find water crystallization hydrated salt. Now, there are some salts which have water present as a part of the salt. We call them hydrated salts. For example, this magnesium sulfate usually does not exist as anhydrous. It actually exists as this formula. Now, if you take a look at this entire formula, you understand this is the part of the salt. And there you have seven molecules of water as a hydrated part of it, which means these seven molecules of water are a part of this salt. That's why we call it hydrated salt, salt with water, in simple terms, what that the word means. Now take a look at this. This empirical formula question has been applied for the number of water molecules the salt may have. No, now the salt is copper sulfate, and there you have water. The mass of copper sulfate is 3.2. The total mass is five. Here you have to do that preliminary step where you uh, subtract the mass of, of one of the given options from the total, and then you get the mass of water, which is 1.8 grams. Now go for the MR, then go for number of moles or molar ratio. When you get the ratio, put them over here. Now this time, you know, you're not gonna put these numbers as one and five as their subscripts. This is the time when you're going to put them on the left as the number of molecules. Okay, so for one molecule of copper sulfate, which is written as like this, we have a dot, the way we separate the hydrated salts, the formula of the salt, as well as water, and this five comes over here. Take a look at this. That's how it's written. CuSO4, the salt is always written first, then there is a dot, then the number of water molecules, and then the formula of water, H2O itself. That's how it is written. We don't have much questions related to hydrated salts back in ICCSD, but you may find two to three questions in a past paper of uh, past papers of a decade, maybe hardly two to three questions in past ten years. That's about it. So I guess this example alone is good enough for you to solve. Do you understand yes, the example sir. given in the book? Yes, sir, but why is there 5.0 as the total number? Sorry, what is the total number? I don't get the first part of your sentence. Why is the 5.0 as the total number? Don't we take 100? I don't get it. These are the masses, this is not the percentage. 
if you're talking about why the total isn't 100, remember the total was only 100 in case of percentage composition questions. These are math questions. This is the second case. In second case, the math can be any number by which we need to subtract the rest of the masses in order to get the math for the unknown one, like they did in the first part, five minus 3.2. I hope you're asking about this part and not by this five. Yeah. Are you? Yes, okay, this five is the total mass, and that's given right over here. This is the whole question thing. They haven't given a specific question if five grams of hydrated copper two sol sulfate crystals are heated to drive a water of crystallization, and the remaining solid has a mass of 3.2 grams, which is copper sulfate. What is the amount of water, ratio of water in the crystal? Now, that's the question. That's how the whole question comes out. So we actually bifurcated the question into a table-like structure. The established structure is always helpful in solving the empirical formula questions. And from there on onward, it's easy because the number of steps or the steps, the order of the steps is actually the same for what we have been doing, the previous class and this class. So I hope this makes sense, right? Yes, sir. What about you, Wes? You've joined us late, but I hope this question makes sense to you too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good, good, great. There aren't many examples of questions like these in past papers. So if you understand this example, this is good enough. You will hardly face uh, two or three questions like these in past 10 years papers, okay? So I'm not gonna pay too much emphasis on them since this would, require more time and that won't be good enough, okay. Uh, how about this example? Are you clear with this example of us? Since you joined late, that's why I'm asking you separately. This is the percentage question. What we have done in this question, I think what may be new to you for this question is just the first two steps. For the rest of the steps, this is what we have been doing in the previous class as well. And since we're, you, you were doing them exactly in the way we want to suppose to, actually you have done all the questions directly in the previous class. So this shouldn't be a problem. The only two steps which are new for us this, at this point are the first two steps. Now, the first step ratio is actually as a, comes as a part of question. So this much would be the part of question. Now we understand that a percentage always ends up at 100. So the total is always going to be 100. This was uh, right now Ariba's question that wasn't the total is supposed to be 100. Yeah, it is supposed to be 100, but in a question where the percentage composition is given. So 100 minus 44 gives you the percentage of oxygen in this compound. Now what we really do is something that is tricky is that we convert this percentage sign into gram sign. There you go. You have the same numbers. Simply replace the percentage sign, sign with grams, and that is your math. Move on with the rest of the question as you were supposed to since case one. You have the masses, you can then write the MR or the AR, go on, find the number of moles, uh, simplify them into a whole number ratio, and then really write your formula by putting them as subscript. I hope this makes sense too, right? Yes, sir. Good, great. Now, okay, if you understand this, let's move on to the molecular formula part. Now, unfortunately, you would notice that there is a molecular formula part at this, at this point. There is a molecular formula question over here in 6.6, .6, but there isn't much help to it how we are supposed to do it. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm first going to explain the molecular formula questions. I'm gonna do it on whiteboard, and then uh, we are going to go for a few examples of it, all right? So let's just get the whiteboard. All right, now for the molecular formula part. As soon as you are done finding the empirical formula, the same question can be converted into a molecular formula by applying two more steps, okay? Those two steps are actually applied to the answer of empirical formula you got. 
So it's really like more like a sequence question. Okay, so let's go with those steps. So remember, a prerequisite for this question is that you already have the empirical formula. Only then you can convert an empirical formula into a molecular formula. Step one is that you have a formula of N. I'm gonna explain what N is, but let me write the formula first. So the numerator is molecular formula mass is divided by the denominator, which in this case is empirical formula mass. So N is a simple whole number. And N can never be equal to zero, okay? So what happens if the examiner is going to convert an empirical formula question into a molecular formula question, the numerator of this formula in molecular formula mass has to be a part of question. Because if you don't know it, you can't really proceed with these two steps. So what the examiner is going to do is that he is going to put molecular formula mass as a part of the question. Now, if you have the empirical formula, you can obviously calculate empirical formula mass. What is that? MR. You know how to calculate MR, molar masses, molecular masses. So if you have the formula, it's really easy to calculate the MR. For example, empirical formula mass for water would be what? The two for hydrogen and the 16 for oxygen, the total would be 18. This is the same thing which we have been calculating before. Now, what we really do in order to get to step two, which is really the step where we get the molecular formula, so we get the molecular formula by multiplying that N with the subscripts of empirical formula. Now this might seem a little tricky to you. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to solve an example question by myself to give you a good idea about this. That's how we go. These are the two simple steps that we go with. Let's do a question. This is going to help you understand the whole thing, the whole point. Just a minute. And this is going to be the question. You'll be given with the elements. You're given either with the masses or with the percentage composition, okay? And you're also given with molecular formula mass. So what you're supposed to do is from the elements and from their percentage composition or their masses, calculate the empirical formula. Then using the molecular formula mass, you're supposed to follow these two steps to calculate the molecular formula. So let's do this question. Now, what I want you to do is that I'm not gonna do the whole question. What you're supposed to do is to continue with this step and calculate what the empirical formula comes out to be. Go ahead. From this specific part question, what do you think the empirical formula is going to be? Go ahead, take your time, calculate the empirical formula. Then say it out loud, say out loud the empirical formula over here as soon as you're done.
let's continue it with me. Uh, sure, to do that one, it would be 92.31. 92.31, good. So that is 92.31 grams, and this one is 7.69 grams. So this we're going to divide by 1, this we're going to divide by 12. So the answer to this one is 7.69, right? And the answer to this one is? If 92.31 is divided by 12, what's the answer to that? Uh, 7.6925. 7.69. Let's stick to three significant figures. So both of them are 7.69, 7.69. If we're going to uh, simplify them, they would turn out to be 1 ratio 1, which actually makes our answer C8. So that's our empirical formula right there. Is enough? Right? Yes, sir. Good, great. So now we are done with seven point, the empirical formula. That was the first step I asked you to do. And that was actually the only step. I was supposed to do the formula portion for you. Now, take a look at this. We need to find out N first. How would we do it? We divide molecular formula mass, which is given over here as 78. There you go, at your top right-hand side. And empirical formula mass is something that we're going to calculate. So for N, that is 78 divided by, now this is CH. C is 12 plus H is one. So empirical formula mass is 13 really. So let's put this 13 right here. So it is 13. The answer to that one is, Six. six, right, perfect. The answer to that one is six. Now, this was the first step. Let's do the second step. Step two, two says that the molecular formula can be taken if we can now multiply the six with the empirical formula. Now, six is outside, the empirical formula is CH. This is the second point in the entire IGCSE book in which you are supposed to change subscripts. Now, you are not supposed to change subscripts all along your book, but there are hardly two or three places where you can, where you're allowed to change the subscripts or touch the subscripts. So this is one of those points where the six is not multiplied by six, it's C or H itself, but actually they're subscripts. So CH means C1, H1. If I multiply six over there, it would become C6, H6. That's what the molecular formula is. And I hope after doing, doing this whole example, it gives you much more, a uh, much better understanding of how you're supposed to go with the entire question. Now, th this is actually uh, somewhat a bigger question because this question actually implies you to first find the empirical formula, then move on with a uh, higher order thinking or into a progressive step of finding the molecular formula. So it really is sometimes a four to five mark question. And I have bifurcated it into exact four parts for which you can get your four exact marks. Usually it's a four mark question. And if you see at the bottom, you'll see four different bifurcations. These four different bifurcations actually get you one mark each. Getting out a proper molar ratio between C and H, one mark taking out the empirical formula or its mass, another mark, finding out the value of the N, another mark, and finally, the correct molecular formula will get you to the last mark. Okay, now any questions so far? No, thanks. No, if there are no more questions, let's me give you uh, one more question as an example. It would be easier for you to go with it and then you'll be good at solving this. Okay, so let's change it to black and I'm gonna give add one more example to it. Okay, 
So P which is forty four percent and O which is actually not given and the molecular formula mass, which I'm gonna short enough for my own ease, though so you you're not allowed to do that in exams really. But I'm going to shorten up the wording just because I'm a little short of space in here. You can continue with uh, the empirical formula for P and O. Remember, let me tell you, this is a question where simplification will come at as a compulsory step to make sure to simplify the molar ratios properly. You might need to multiply both of them with a the proper number to do that. I'm giving you a hint up front, so make sure you don't end up with the wrong empirical formula. There you go. The molecular formula mass is 284. Now, you're going to tell me three things in this question. What is your empirical formula as soon as you're done with it? What's the value of n? And finally, what's your molecular formula? Take your time. I'm here if you need me in case of any confusion. That the empirical formula for this P and O question is actually P2O5. From there on onwards, there are just two steps calculating N. The first step calculating the molecular formula itself, the second step. So if any one of you has calculated the value of N for the first step, let me know. Sir, is it two? Two. Perfect. The value of N is two, which makes the molecular formula in step two as so I am gonna write these simple answer steps over here. So the first thing that we found out was that the empirical formula was P two O five. Now, in the next step, the first step for the molecular formula, we found out that the value of n was equal to two. That really makes this two as a multiplying factor for this P2O5. So P, the two of P becomes two to the? P4O10. P4O10, right? That should be easy. So this two after multiplication with two becomes four, this five after multiplication with two becomes 10. So the molecular formula is P4O10. So I hope you completely follow. Do you? Okay. What about you, Wes? Do you get it? Um, so I'm kind of confused. Uh, what is the empirical formula set for P and O? P205? Yeah. That you can take from the book. Okay, let me actually share that screen with you. So I'm gonna first solve the P205 part with you. Okay, this is page number 161. On the top of which, right hand side, you're going to find this question, P and O. Now this P is 44%. I actually took the question out of here. So this is 44%, so 100 minus 44, 56. Now you have 44 grams and 56 grams. Take out the values of out of the periodic table for ammonium mass. 31 is the mass of phosphorus, 16 is the mass of oxygen. You uh, get the number of moles by dividing these values, 1.4 and 3.5. After you divide 1.4 and 3.5, this turns out to be 1 and 2.5. Now, these are still not whole numbers. 
So what we do, what not mentioned in the book, and you need to understand with my previous explanation is that we multiply both of these numbers by two. So when one is multiplied by two, the answer comes out to be two. When 2.5 is multiplied by two, the answer comes out to be five. So it then becomes P2 of five. Now, do you understand this part of the question? I hope this part of the question is clear now, Wes. Is it? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, I kind of got confused in the decimals when the answer is at decimals, sir. Uh, how many point numbers should I take after the decimal? Should it be one or two? Okay. Because I remember, I keep saying, I keep quoting one specific thing. I keep saying three significant figures. Now, three significant figures is actually a mathematical rule which doesn't have to do anything with chemistry or physics or bio, but we apply this mathematical rule to all kinds of things. Now, three significant figures means if there is one number before the decimal, let's say two point something, then there should be at least two more digits after it. So one, two, three. I hope that makes sense. Now, if there is 42.69, so you can simply take one, two, three. Get the point? Three significant yes, figures. So if there is nothing before uh, the decimal, I mean, it's 0, 0.00 something, then you need to take three significant figures. For example, it's 0 0.0017. Seven, eight. Then the one, seven, and eight are three significant figures. You can't consider these zeros. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So it's actually a three significant figure rule. Now, because of this rule, we're never sure how many numbers before or after the decimal we're going to take, because it can be really different for different numbers. So that's why I keep quoting the rule, the three significant figure rules. Now, whenever I quote this phrase that you're supposed to take three significant figures, count the figures for yourself for every single question, part question or answer that you usually calculate with the help of a calculator and then uh, figure out for yourself which numbers are you going to take. But the, there are some numbers before the decimal or after the decimal that are going to be a part of those three significant figures. I hope you get the point right. Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, are we clear with the empirical formula part? And can we get back to the molecular formula part? Sure. Okay. So if we're clear, I'm going to stop sharing over here. I'm going to get back to the whiteboard. And I hope now it's much better. So now we have P2O5. Now, I have already written that P2O5 over here. Okay, so there we go, we have P2O5. Now, if you're gonna put these values in N, this 284 and the calculation of mass from P2O5, you are going to get the answer two. Are you gonna get that? I'm gonna do it over on to the far left side. So N is equal to 284 up top. Now add in the denominator, we are supposed to write P2O5. Now, what is P in periodic table? That is 31, so 31 multiplied by two. What is O in periodic table? That is 16, so 16 multiplied by five. So now, if you're gonna do it with the calculator, this is 62 and this is 80, so we're gonna end up at 142. So this actually is 142. So when you're gonna cut them out, this is gonna be one, this is gonna be two, and that's how you're gonna end up at two. So that's how we ended up at two. Now this two is supposed to be multiplied by this P2O5. So two twos are four, so P becomes four, five twos are 10, so O becomes 10. I hope that makes sense, right? I've been a little bit faster with my calculations, but I hope this all makes sense to you. Does it? Are you there? Can you hear me? Oh. 
Okay. Yes, I, I think he has some kind of issue. So I think this whole thing is now understandable, no. but if you have any questions, you can ask me in the next sitting. I'll definitely answer those questions. Okay. So if there are no more questions, can we wind up the call since it's about time? 